You know, sometimes the game releases and support for the game moving forward ends right before the game actually hit its stride. Or in some cases, a game gets outright canceled before it even got a chance to release and the game would have been incredible. Today, we want to look at those games that almost reached their glory, but unfortunately just fell short. And now we're stuck wondering what could have happened had that game made it just a little bit longer. Let's jump into this. Okay, let's take a second. Pretend that it's the year 2014. Imagine hearing that the popular game series Silent Hill is coming back in a bigger way than ever before, being led by the Hideo Kojima himself, starring the actor of the most popular character of the Walking Dead TV series. And this is 2014 when like the Walking Dead hype was at its highest ever. Silent Hills was one of the biggest and most anticipated revivals to a game series that I can remember from like the last decade. I mean like Norman Reedus was really really hyped up back then like remember all the like if Daryl dies we riot shirts that they sold at Hot Topic or whatever. It's kind of weird looking back now. Nonetheless Silent Hills showed a lot of promise and to tease the game they released a playable teaser something that has never really been done before and that game demo alone was like a huge hit. It was spooky it was cool and it was setting the stage for a full game experience this is incredible. However, in 2015, reports started emerging that the relationship between Konami and Hideo Kojima had turned very sour, and that would become evident with what would happen with the Metal Gear series moving forward after Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Konami was doing some weird stuff to try to distance themselves from Hideo Kojima, and ultimately it was revealed that the game was cancelled. After that, Hideo Kojima would go off to make his own game, Death Stranding, and still part up with Norman Reedus for that, and Konami delisted that trailer that they made for Silent Hills that was really fun. And while there were rumors that the project would maybe get revived in some way or another, it never happened. And finally, in 2022, Konami announced a new Silent Hill game that is effectively replacing the Silent Hills that never happened, made by a completely new team and a completely new director, Al Yang. They announced Silent Hill F. But still, we'll always wonder what Silent Hills would have looked like being created by Hideo Kojima and what the plan was after that really awesome demo that players got to experience as a way to announce a game rather than just showing the stereotypical teaser. Okay, this next one, some people are going to get really angry about and they're going to pull out their pitchforks, but hear me out for a second. Call of Duty Ghosts back in 2013 got way more hate than it probably deserved big picture looking back now. I mean, I understand why in 2013 it was hated on almost universally by Call of Duty players. The maps were way too big, they probably were trying to do some big team battle thing and then later in development decided to tone it back down to the traditional gameplay, and the campaign felt more like a Fast and Furious movie than maybe something like Black Hawk Down. Sure, there were some other issues, but big picture, had the Call of Duty community known what Call of Duty would look like the following years after Call of Duty Ghosts, where more or less, it seemed like Call of Duty would just occasionally hit and then miss over and over again randomly. Looking back at the last 10 years of Call of Duty, Ghost might have not have been the best game to release in the last 10 years, but it definitely wasn't the worst one. Of course, it was going to get panned coming out after Black Ops 2, which is often deemed as possibly the best Call of Duty of all time, maybe tying with Modern Warfare 2. And when it comes to Call of Duty, we don't always get to hear what happened to prototypes or ideas for Call of Duty games that end up getting scrapped early in development. But I'm pretty sure, like 99% positive, there were plans for a Call of Duty Ghosts sequel. Infinity Ward didn't develop Ghosts as a one and done idea. I mean, the end of the game literally is set on a massive cliffhanger. And I often wonder what a Ghosts 2 campaign could have looked like had we actually gotten it instead of Infinite Warfare. I mean, sure, the ghost story was over the top and goofy at times, but there's also a reason why some action movies like Fast and Furious get so many sequels and do well in the box office. I don't know, the ghost games got to the point at developing who the good guys were and who the bad guys were pretty quickly. You get some interesting lore dropped in there, but it's not overly complicated like something you'd see out of Black Ops 3. And yeah, by the end of the campaign, you are somewhat invested in who lives and who dies, and we never really got to see that conclusion. Remember, during Modern Warfare, Warfare 3's development, half of Infinity Ward left, and it was up to Sledgehammer Games to step in and fill in the missing personnel to finish up Modern Warfare 3, while Infinity Ward would have to slowly grow their company back up again with new personnel. So the Infinity Ward at Call of Duty in 2013 was very different from the same Infinity Ward that made the Modern Warfare trilogy, and I do wonder if this team would have improved substantially over time if they were able to continue to iterate on this ghost story that was original to this team. I think maybe they could have hit their stride with Ghosts 2 
2 and 3, especially having things like Extinction Mode, which was a really interesting concept. And for a while there, it was technically the only quote unquote modern Call of Duty available on next generation consoles for quite some time. But hey, in this game, you got a dog, so all is good. I mean, no matter where you stand on the advanced movement games, three years of advanced movement back to back, followed by a World War II shooter that was sometimes okay, followed by a Black Ops game that didn't have a campaign. I don't know, Call of Duty Ghosts kind of seemed like a good Call of Duty for a little while there. I don't know. I'm still holding out a sliver of hope that maybe we'll get a future Call of Duty title that acts as a sequel to Ghosts, even though I don't think they'll ever make a straight up Ghosts 2. They could still do something with the story, but at the same time, it does feel like more and more Call of Duty is shifting to a one single timeline across all companies, which causes a whole lot of other confusion when we think about Black Ops 2 and what's coming up. I digress. Maybe one day we'll find out what happened to the Walker brothers. Rourke is still out there at large, even though he did make an appearance in Warzone randomly, but technically because of how Ghosts takes place in the timeline, it can't just merge in with the rest of the timeline because it has like some crazy stuff like South America becoming a world superpower. Nonetheless, some of the locales in Ghosts are pretty cool, like Santa Monica and Vegas, and there were some other exciting things about Ghost. Remember back in the day, I think there was a game theory video made about ghosts? Like, Ghost was kind of relevant for a minute, even if it was universally unpopular when it came out. I don't know. I'm too much of a ghost defender. I know. I'm sorry. Let's just go to the next one. From what little we know about Rainbow Six Patriots, we can tell that this game might have gotten really dark. And we'll talk about that in just a second. We do not have a sponsor for today's video, so instead of just like wasting your guys' time with a full ad read, I'm just gonna remind you guys that you can use code ROCKETSLOTH and fill up on gamer subs. You support our channel by using our code, and you also get some great tasting energy. As you can probably hear from my voice, I'm fighting off the flu I've had for two weeks, and I've just been staying as hydrated as I can chugging gamer sups. I've been really liking the Arctic Cooler flavor lately, though Guacamole Gamer Fart by the Russian Badger is still my favorite. Listen, they have cool cups that could make great gifts too. Maybe they'll help you get a girlfriend. Maybe they'll help someone else you know get a girlfriend. It's a good gift, come on. Anyways, no super long ad read. Just stock up and let's get back into it. Honestly, Rainbow Six has a very interesting history when it comes to its franchise in itself before the Rainbow Six Siege days and to an extent even after. Does anyone remember Rainbow Six Patriots? This was a Rainbow Six game announced way before the Siege days and this whole trailer release that was like a concept as to what the gameplay could look like. It wasn't an actual gameplay trailer. And man, it actually was dark. Like they were planning on taking Taking this story in places that these types of games never really had gone before. But yeah, there was a lot more going on with Rainbow Six Patriots than a lot of average consumers watching this trailer at E3 probably realized. So this trailer originally was leaked apparently, and I guess Ubisoft knew that it was leaked, so they decided to release it themselves to get ahead of the leaks. But this was just like a concept idea for a game, and it wasn't necessarily something that was like fully greenlit and deeply being developed on yet. It was still like a conceptual idea. And ultimately, this game ended up falling apart, and instead, Rainbow Six Siege, a game focused more on multiplayer, tactical, competitive gameplay, was created instead. Though we never actually got to see a Rainbow Six campaign in either the form of what Patriots could have been or with Rainbow Six Siege. This was during a time where Ubisoft regularly was making trailers to announce games that weren't actual representations of what the game would look like. But still, in a way, since Rainbow Six Siege didn't have a true campaign, campaign with it. I kind of wish they would have taken some of those ideas from Patriots and made a campaign to go alongside this game that was so multiplayer heavy. Or at least I would have liked to experience whatever Rainbow Six Patriots could have been if they actually would have put the resources to bringing this trailer to life. On the flip side of things, we could look after Rainbow Six Siege and see that there's been a lot of attempts to do more with the Rainbow Six IP that kind of fell apart. We're not even talking about like this whole Tom Clancy mobile game crossover thing that had characters from Siege. I'm talking about things like Rainbow Six Extraction. Way back Back in the earlier years of Rainbow Six Siege, they did this like alien horror crossover as an event in Rainbow Six Siege, which was really cool. And from that, they greenlit an entire spinoff taking that idea and fleshing it out even more. Rainbow Six Extraction released after years of development and a couple of delays. And I think there was a lot of potential with this idea, this game, and this concept, but just the way that the game was handled, too many wrong decisions led to this game essentially having its ongoing support and future development halting after just a year of its release, and ultimately it came down to player retention being pretty much abysmal. Now the game is fun for a little while before it starts to get repetitive, and in a game like this you would think having multiple different operators to play 
Reyes would kind of keep that replayability factor alive to an extent, but I think ultimately the fact that this game required you to change operators regularly, even if you didn't want to and you just wanted to keep playing as the main operator that you've been working on, made it kind of frustrating to get into a grind loop of playing the game regularly because you had to work on multiple operators at a time. If you ended up dying or failing an operation, it was this whole to-do to get your operator back. And on top of that, the game is really hard. It is a tactical alien survival game, which is kind of cool to the people who really like that, but really hard for casuals that would try this game out as a different experience from the very competitive Rainbow Six Siege. There were some really cool ideas here, and I just wonder if this would have worked better as a expansion to Rainbow Six Siege and not its own entity completely detached from Siege, because it does feel weird. It has all these awesome cosmetics in that game that don't carry over into Rainbow Six Siege. The main people playing this game likely also play Rainbow Six Siege and switch back and forth, so it just felt weird. There were so many opportunities where I felt like they could have done something where you could level up a battle pass and get cosmetics for Rainbow Six Siege's multiplayer. That would be a great incentive to play this side game, and they just didn't do that connectivity. You could unlock some operators, I guess, by playing this other game, but by this point, most people had majority of the operators they wanted by now. It's a shame this game was actually fun for a bit. It just didn't go that extra mile it needed to just solidify it and lock it down as something that could last longer than people picking up the game for a couple of weeks and being done with it. Okay, now there are a few specific ones that are a little bit quicker that I did want to talk about in this video. Battlefield Bad Company 3. I know we've never had an official announcement, and we don't know when this game would have potentially released, but what we do know is at the end of the story mode of Battlefield Bad Company 2, there's a pretty massive cliffhanger that, like, the United States is being invaded, and it's like, oh no, what's gonna happen now? And then nothing. We never got another Bad Company game, so uh, maybe it's time EA takes another look and maybe thinks about bringing this one back. I think uh, Battlefield's kind of gone through a reputation hit in recent years, and they haven't done much with the Bad Company series in a while, so maybe it's time to use this to regain some goodwill with Battlefield fans and bring back a beloved little duology of games. But yeah, obviously at some point along the line, there was plans for Battlefield Bad Company 3, because why would they end Bad Company 2 on a cliffhanger if they weren't going to pursue it in the future. We just never saw anything happen again. Maybe there had been confusion if they released a Bad Company 3 after releasing Battlefield 3, which was unrelated to Bad Company 2. But hey, it's not like Battlefield is a stickler for naming conventions, because we got Battlefield 1 after Battlefield 4, well, and Hardline. Then we got Battlefield 5? Like, they can give us Bad Company 3 at this point, and nobody will question it. I don't think there are many games out there that cannibalized itself and its community as quickly as the once popular game known as Evolve. This game back in 2014 was all the hype. Created by former Valve game directors who had worked on games like Left 4 Dead and Counter-Strike, was a unique take on a cooperative game that pitted four players against one monster player. Yeah, this game predated other games like Dead by Daylight that has like the four versus one style to it. And when this game went into a public alpha at the end of 2014, so many people got to try this game out and and the game was actually a really fun experience. Essentially, four people take control of the hunters while a fifth player is controlling a monster. The group of players have to work together to track the monster down, and the monster has to fulfill certain requirements to evolve and grow strong enough to face off against the hunters and take them out. So yeah, that alpha months before the release of the game was really exciting, and I think it drew a lot of attention to the game, but as fans were eager to get their hands on Evolve and start playing the game, this game's post-release planning essentially caused all of the hype that they had built up to essentially implode on itself, resulting in a lot of people being essentially just turned away from this game. Now remember, this was back before the typical games as a live service type thing really locked in place like we see nowadays. So the ideas of things like season passes, battle passes, and even content after the initial release was kind of a different thing. Most people were just used to seeing things like map packs out of Call of Duty, and Turtle Rock Studios got a lot of support when they announced that, for the most part, all maps would be free of charge moving forward. However, besides the fact that players had to pay a full $60 to purchase this game on day one, new monsters and hunters, all who had their own abilities, would be sold separately as parts of DLC, and you could buy the season pass that would give you access to more things,
things. And back then, the term Season Pass was really only ever used by other games like Call of Duty, which typically meant you would get all of the DLC for the life of that game, usually about a year. But it became apparent that even the Season Pass wouldn't cover all of the DLC that would be added to the game, and a second Season Pass would be offered later on. But before even all of that came to light, on day one, there was already 44 different paid DLCs available for the game, and a lot of it wasn't restricted to cosmetic. They were characters with abilities that you could only get if you paid extra on top of the $60 base price of the game. And there were balancing issues that made it seem like some of the DLC characters were much better, making the game sometimes feel pay to win, and there wasn't like an easy path to unlock the characters without spending money at the launch of the game. This just made the whole launch feel substantially less exciting than how the alphas felt when everybody was on an equal playing field. On top of all of that, publisher 2K saw an interest during the alpha and beta phases of the game and thought that this game could potentially become a large esports game and encouraged Turtle Rock Studios to develop features that would make the game more appealing to the competitive esports scene. There were a couple of interesting tie-in tournaments that were done to promote like films like Chappie or a Pro-Am tournament. They even tried to launch a new game mode that would have been easier and less strategic to appeal to the esports scene, which was kind of weird. But with the DLC controversy, player numbers were dwindling, and by 2016, just about a year and a half after its launch, Turtle Rock announced that the game would transition into a free-to-play model known as Evolve Stage 2. Now, Stage 2 sounded promising. You'd be now able to unlock the characters and items through just playing the game. Players who had spent money would get a Founders status, which would give them, like, extra stuff or something. And Turtle Rock Studios promised updates much more regularly. And then, just a few months later, they announced that the update would not be rolling out to consoles. And then, it seemed like development ultimately slowed, and 2K ended up making the decision to close down the dedicated servers, allowing peer-to-peer -peer connection still, where a small community of players would still continue to enjoy the game for a couple of years. Oddly enough, randomly, in July of 2022, the multiplayer servers for Evolve Stage 2 on PC were re-enabled, which was really interesting, and there were things like daily login bonuses and free Steam keys available to dedicated Evolve members on their Discord. And then in July, the servers were shut down for the final time, rendering the game pretty much entirely unplayable now. You know, Evolve had something there. They bit off more than they could chew by how they planned to try to support the game in the future. If they would have started off free to play, they could have had all of that hype similar to what they had during the free to play public alpha and beta. And maybe if they periodically released the DLC and not just had it all available at the get go, trying to get as much money out of players right away on day one, this game could have had a huge lasting impact. And there could have been a lot more for Evolve and the future of this franchise, especially with what they wanted to do with the rework of the entire game system. It just seemed like the player base ended up being too small at the end and bridges were burnt. It's interesting though, because another game, Dead by Daylight, is an asymmetrical four versus one game that came out around the same time that survived and thrived off of having a free to play but supported life cycle with new expansions coming out periodically. Sure, in 2014, games being supported a long time on consoles and whatnot wasn't commonplace, but just a year later, games like Rainbow Six Siege released, and later, Overwatch, No Man's Sky. Sure, the games didn't have perfect launches, but it did show a shift in games that were supported for a long time. Those three games are still around today, but Evolve, not so much. Maybe 2K pulled the plug too early, or the damage maybe was just done too early. I don't really know. One of the bigger announcements at E3 2012 was Star Wars 1313, a third-person action-adventure game that was focused on fast-paced combat mixed with a darker vibe for the Star Wars universe looked like a promising idea. Many people at the time called it like Star Wars' answer to Uncharted, which I guess that's a good way to describe what this game would have been like, at least gameplay wise. So overall, I think Star Wars fans were pretty excited for this project. The trailer looked cool, the gameplay didn't look bad, at least a little bit that we saw. And going into 2013, everybody seemed like they just wanted to know more about this game. Though 2013 was also a dark year when it came to Star Wars video games. Because after Lucasfilm was acquired by Disney in October of 2012, they did close down LucasArts in March of 2013. Meaning that all internal projects were suspended, and that included Star Wars 1313. Right after that happened, people were also speculating that there might be a different studio brought in, maybe it'll be licensed out, and Star Wars 1313 will still continue to be developed in some form. But no such deal ever materialized. And in 2014,
2014, Disney also let the trademark for Star Wars 1313 expire, which was the final nail in the coffin. But going a couple of years back in the Star Wars video game timeline, Star Wars Battlefront 3 was also in development at some point between 2006 and 2008. This game would have just built on the first Star Wars Battlefront games, it would have just been the natural sequel, there would have been some evolutions in gameplay, like the seamless transition between ground and space battles. The development for this project began in 2006 at Free Radical Design, who are known for making the Time Splitters games. Now, why this was cancelled and what happened to it, there's multiple statements that kind of contradict each other. On one hand, I think there was official statements like goals not being met and development troubles in general. And then also in 2008, LucasArts' management kind of shifted and they were the publisher for this project. So they kind of started some bad blood relationship between Star Wars Battlefront 3's developer Free Radical Design and LucasArts. And those were kind of the official statements that they kind of had a falling out and then goals weren't being met and you know the game kind of fell apart from there. But there's developers that worked on the game that said that the game was near completion when it was cancelled. But this was also contested by a former LucasArts employee. So it's not quite clear what's real here or how far Star Wars Battlefront 3 made it. All we do know for a fact though is that a lot of the assets were reused for Star Wars Battlefront Elite Squadron which was the PSP spin-off. And some of you might have recognized me showing the Star Wars Battlefront Elite Squadron on the screen while I was talking about Star Wars Battlefront 3. But it is the closest thing we have to kind of getting a glimpse into what Star Wars Battlefront 3 would have been like. And I mean, the first two Star Wars Battlefront games were banger. I'm sure the third one would have also been cool. All we can hope for is that maybe if the game is near finished, that one day maybe it'll leak or maybe there'll be like an official release or something. But there's one more Star Wars related thing I wanted to talk about, but I think I'm gonna save that for later in this video. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that ultimately overpromised and then failed to deliver. But you know what? Despite all of the issues Cyberpunk had when it launched, I was a fan before the game came out, I was a fan after the game came out with its flaws and all because I saw the creativity and the potential just dripping through every weird glitch that still existed in the game. The game shouldn't have released that way, absolutely not, but hey, the game's in a lot better state now and people are finally really appreciating Cyberpunk 2077 and as a biased fanboy probably in this regard, I am happy to see that. But man, there's two parts of Cyberpunk that never got realized despite the fact that they were announced and kind of toted as being this big deal for the future of the franchise. First, there's the obvious, like, true branching story that was advertised like a year before the game was set to release. So many things from that reveal ended up getting cut from the game that would have been awesome to actually see in the game and really would have fleshed out the story experience. But there was also this whole multiplayer thing that they were talking about before Cyberpunk 2077 released that obviously never came. I mean, they talked about this thing enough to where they were even detailing how microtransactions would work and how the game would be free to play and all this other stuff. Where was any of that? Did they not know that the game was in critical condition that they would have to spend years fixing it up afterwards? There were also supposed to be two story DLCs to release within a year of Cyberpunk 2077's release that never obviously came. I assume a lot of those ideas got combined and were put into the Phantom Liberty expansion. But yo, Cyberpunk's planning team was like huffing their own copium before this game released, thinking that they were going to get so much done in a very short amount of time. I mean, look at this roadmap. So yeah, a lot of this stuff ended up never releasing or getting cut. And we know there's going to be more cyberpunk experiences in the future. That's already been confirmed. But just think, there were plans for a multiplayer cyberpunk experience that we would have been playing for years at this point. It probably wouldn't have run all that well. But the concept of taking this world and bringing it to life in the form of something like we would see out of GTA Online sounds absolutely incredible. But they got to get the base game right first before they can do these giant side quests like a multiplayer mode. If they couldn't even get the third person stuff working by launch, whether it was intentional or a technical issue that they couldn't spend more time on, I think believing that they would be able to get an online game working together within a year of Cyberpunk's release seemed a little bit out there. It's crazy, I'd still love to see all of these ideas incorporated into future Cyberpunk games because, like I said, I'm a huge fan of this series and I'm probably going to be seeing things more biased than a more critical Cyberpunk player. So if you think I'm just huffing my own copium at this point, let me know in the comments. I understand how it could feel that way. Now, unless you're like a huge Nintendo nerd, you might not have actually heard of this game, but it would have been incredible. Well, probably. Dinosaur Planet for the Nintendo 64. Now, this game was developed by Rare, who had a reputation of making some of the greatest N64 games of all time. Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong 64, Goldeneye, Perfect Dark. They were working on their own adventure game, probably to the likes of what you would expect from a Legend of Zelda game. And this game actually made it really far into development 
development, and there was a lot of pre-released footage put out there in the world promoting this game. However, towards the end of the Nintendo 64's life, Nintendo came in and was like, hey, why don't you guys just move this project onto the GameCube and make it look really cool? Also, you need to use the Star Fox IP, because we don't know what to do with this IP, and your character kind of looks like our character, so make it happen. So, the concepts and ideas from this original Dinosaur Planet game were reworked and redesigned to become a Star Fox game that played not too much like a Star Fox game. I mean, there was a little bit of flying, and I guess characters were brought over, but for the most part, it felt kind of like a Legend of Zelda-like game that had Fox McCloud in it for some reason. Now, here's the thing. Even with these weird things being forced upon the game, Star Fox Adventures still was overall a pretty solid game. Like, it was fleshed out. We don't see games kind of come out of nowhere for a not large IP as long and intricate as what we had with Star Fox Adventures. However, I can't help but to think that the original vision for the N64 with the Dinosaur Planet would have been much cooler. They would have been bound to trying to tie in lore elements for Star Fox to make it make sense, and they could have explored these characters a whole lot more. It seemed like the character that got turned into Crystal would have had a bigger role in the original game. And a couple of years ago, there was a big leak that actually had a few different builds of the prototype versions of Dinosaur Planet unveiled to the public, meaning that you can now go and play versions of the original Dinosaur Planet and see really how far along development was before they had to completely stop everything and start working on the GameCube version of the game, which likely meant rebuilding a lot of assets from the ground up. Sure, a lot of stuff stayed, but man, this game took a very different shape. I don't know, it would have been really cool to see what this game could have been if it just stuck to being its own thing and didn't have to be tied to an existing franchise. It probably could have still been a franchise today, though maybe it would have shown up on Xbox, or maybe they would do the whole banjo nuts and bolts treatment to it and ruin it. I don't know. All right, can we take a second and just pour some gamer subs out for our fallen knockout city game? This game was like a really interesting take on dodgeball and sure, sometimes it felt like the latency would make you want to scream. Overall, this game was really promising. I had a lot of fun playing it, but I think the biggest downfall to this game was the fact that it launched at not a free to play value. And I feel like that probably hindered this game from reaching the masses because overall this game is a cool concept and it was pretty polished and got regular content updates. Sadly enough, even the late shift to free-to-play wasn't enough to keep this game lucrative, and I felt like if they maybe had a better start day one, maybe this game would still be around today. But unfortunately, they went the route of only using free-to-play as a last-ditch effort when they already had room for microtransactions and battle passes built into the game, and I think that that ended up being its downfall. Unfortunately, you can't play this game anymore in matchmaking, only private lobbies, and that's a shame. There was times where I would just hop on this game every once in a while and have a pretty good time and that was cool so I'm disappointed with where this game ended. Anthem is a game. It looked really promising when it was announced, and then the game came out and it was really boring. After the backlash, it was announced that Anthem is getting a massive update in the form of Anthem Next, but then that got canceled too. Executives don't care about your feelings, and it's a shame because this game, if good, would have been able to give Destiny a run for its money, with all the dumb decisions they have made. So yeah, rest in peace, Anthem. In September of 2002, Blizzard Entertainment officially announced a game called StarCraft Ghost. This would have been a third-person spin-off of the StarCraft universe. It was initially intended to release on PlayStation 2, the original Xbox, and Nintendo GameCube. And over the next couple years, Blizzard released more details about the game, including gameplay mechanics and its focus on the protagonist Nova. There was even a playable demo at E3 that people could play. While development started with the studio Nihilistic Software, it would eventually move to Swinging Ape Studios. And shortly after Swinging Ape Studios got contracted to work on this game, they were actually purchased by Blizzard, which indicated a continued commitment to StarCraft Ghost. But it didn't take long before Blizzard announced an indefinite postponement of StarCraft Ghost's development to focus on other projects. Over the next eight years, Blizzard would kind of mention the game sometimes, indicating that they hadn't forgotten about it, but there was never any mention of active development on the game. In 2016, there was a StarCraft 2 DLC release called Nova Covert Ops, which focused on the same protagonist that StarCraft Ghost would have focused on. And honestly, at that point, it just seemed like they reused some assets and whatever, maybe some ideas to put into the StarCraft 2 DLC, even though it wasn't the same gameplay style. And with that, StarCraft Ghost was 
dead and I mean, it'll probably never come out. The game looked fun though. I would have played it. So I don't know, maybe they shouldn't have canceled it. Maybe they should have put it out. The only thing I can think is that maybe the project wasn't progressing along as well, or maybe they thought the StarCraft fans wouldn't like the shift in gameplay style. The leaked gameplay I've seen though, looks kind of cool. So it's kind of sad that this ended up getting canned. Similarly, another very popular story from around the same time, Spec Ops The Line kind of ended in a place where fans definitely expected a sequel to come just for nothing to ever come of that. I think to this day, people still look at Spec Ops The Line as a masterpiece in militaristic storytelling. So why haven't we seen anything else? Maybe the game didn't sell well enough, but I think nowadays the game had enough of a cult following where if they did do a follow-up game that was still as narratively driven, maybe the game would do better this next time around. One of the main developers that worked on Spec Ops The Line is Jaeger, who worked on, afterwards, Dead Island 2 before getting cut from the project by Deep Silver. They then put out a flight simulating fighting game called Dreadnought that ended up getting sunsetted earlier on this year. Then in 2020, Tencent invested in the company and there was supposed to be like a new PvPVE extraction shooter released. That got delayed multiple times in 2022. It finally released called The Cycle Frontier and uh, the game wasn't really received too well and it was announced that it would be sunsetted in September of 2023, just a couple of months ago at the time of recording this audio. So uh, who knows what's next for the studio? Maybe they'll work on Spec Ops The Line if they have the rights to it? I don't actually know where the rights fall for this. I think Take-Two Interactive owns the rights to Spec Ops, so it would either take a new partnership with Jaeger and Take-Two, or Take-Two Interactive would have to find a new studio to work on a follow-up title. Probably one of the reasons why we've never actually seen that sequel that fans anticipated for Spec Ops The Line. You know, for a really long time, Duke Nukem Forever had the reputation of being one of these games that was so far in development hell that people thought it would never actually release. And sure, that's fair. You should watch our development hell video if you haven't seen that one already. But Duke Nukem Forever is an interesting game. It did release on the Xbox 360 PS3 era, but way before that, there was an iteration of the game that was supposed to release closer to the expected release window of the early 2000s. And after years of speculation, finally a build of that game ended up actually releasing and it looked kind of promising. Sure, not much of the game was fully finished, but from what was playable and what people have been able to uncover looking through the files and playing through the game itself, there was kind of some true to form Duke Nukem experience from the early 2000s that unfortunately got shut down and canceled just for the development of the game to stall out and be started over multiple times before the version of Duke Nukem Forever that we know and experience that did finally release came out to a mixed reception. Would this original build of Duke Nukem that got leaked have been better? Well, we don't really know, but there is a large community effort to try to restore as much as possible of that, and that is promising to say the least from a franchise that nowadays is pretty much dormant. Okay, there's a couple other games that also got canceled before they really could shine that were originally going to release on the Xbox line of consoles. Matter of fact, we did an entire video on every canceled Xbox game where we go more in depth on all of these, so we're not gonna spend as much time on them, but let's just look at some of these Xbox games that could have been really awesome. Scalebound, developed by the legendary people at Platinum Games. This game would have been a dragon game. It was announced at E3 for Xbox. It looked incredible. The visuals that were shown off looked truly beautiful, and this game unexpectedly was cancelled in early 2017, the year that the game was supposed to release. Despite the fact that the game seemed to have been going on for quite some time, and other little announcements like the fact that it would have 4 player co-op, multiplayer in it, that there was working gameplay of the game, it was set to come out on the Xbox One and on the PC, ultimately, apparently the gameplay just wasn't up to the standard that both Platinum Games and Microsoft were looking for, and the whole game ended up getting scrapped from there. Nowadays, Microsoft does own the rights to Scalebound if they ever wanted to resurrect this project, and Platinum Games has said that they'd be willing to come back and work on it some more, but it kind of leaves it up to Microsoft to make that decision. But man, this one would have been really cool. Another big game franchise that Microsoft had was the Fable franchise, and Microsoft was really milking Fable towards the end of the Xbox 360's life, making an anniversary game, a Kinect game, and then they were trying to make this big, larger action RPG game that was actually really far into development. There were trailers, there were alphas and betas rolled out for the game, 
Like, people were already playing the game for a while during those play tests, so the game had to have been nearing its completion. However, the game still did need some tender, loving care in the last arc of the game's development. And ultimately, Microsoft kind of just pulled the plug not only on this game, but on all of Lionhead Studios, the people who made every Fable game. That was unexpected and almost out of character for Microsoft. Microsoft, in the following years, would make a big effort into grow their studios for game development, so this seemed like maybe one of the last big calls of that leadership, and now there hasn't been a Fable game in years, and it might still be years before we finally see Fable 4 one day come out. But Microsoft had experience with some other interesting ideas, like Halo Titan, which Luke knows more about because he plays more MMOs than I do. Now, out of any of the games we've talked about, this one kind of piqued my interest the most over the years, and that is the Halo MMO codenamed Titan. In the early 2000s, the rise of World of Warcraft brought a lot of popularity and attention to the MMO genre, and Microsoft and Ensemble Studios wanted to hop on that train after the release of Halo 2 in 2004. That's when they started working on Titan. This MMO would have been set in the Halo universe, obviously, but way back in the Forerunner era, which is way before any of the mainline Halo games take place. It's kind of like the Old Republic to explain it in Star Wars terms for anyone that doesn't know Halo too well. I don't think I've ever actually seen gameplay of this, but I mean, from the screenshots, you can kind of tell that it probably would have played like any other MMO at the time, which that's fine, honestly. And I mean, personally, the MMOs I've always enjoyed the most are the ones that feel the closest to World of Warcraft. While there is no gameplay, there's a lot of concept art, and the concept art alone looks super sick in my opinion. Halo has a rich lore and universe, so it instantly would have felt like the whole world is part of this bigger thing, which I think would have been amazing for world building. The project was ultimately cancelled in 2007, the reasons for the cancellations are not entirely clear, but I don't know, maybe Microsoft didn't think an MMO for Halo was the right decision at the time anymore. And Assemble Studios went on to make another Halo spin-off in Halo Wars, and then they closed down after developing Halo Wars. Now I do think if this game came out in the late 2010s, this could have been a big deal. Just considering how massive Halo 3 was and going into reach how much hype there was for the Halo franchise in general. Halo used to be a massive thing in pop culture and used to be relevant, so something like an MMO would have massively expanded the player base and the interest in Halo, in my opinion. More so than an RTS game, I think. Also, the MMO hype was so big back in the mid to late 2000s that Blizzard themselves wanted another slice, and they went ahead and announced another MMO called Project Titan in 2007. This was intended to be a new flagship title following the success of World of Warcraft. However, after seven years of development, Blizzard cancelled the project in 2014 due to challenges in meeting their quality standards and difficulties in defining the gameplay. I think they themselves said that the game kinda sucked to play and wasn't fun, so they cancelled it. Some of the concepts and ideas though from this Project Titan were later repurposed into the creation of Overwatch, so I guess in a way it kinda lives on. It's just interesting that there's two big MMO projects, both called Titan, that would've probably been kinda cool to play. Okay, there's another game that's probably not as talked about for a list like this, but I'm gonna bring it up real quick just because it's another personal one that I would've really loved to see. Perfect Dark was an incredible Nintendo 64 game. It was a follow-up to what Rare had made in GoldenEye, but this time they're building out their own futuristic sci-fi spy world. And after Perfect Dark released to much acclaim, there were plans for a follow-up game, and that would have been really incredible also. Not too many details are known, but there was talks about the game being possibly called Velvet Dark, there were scripts written, there were redesigns of characters already in the conceptual phases, so this game was coming along, but ultimately after some key members of the staff departed, Microsoft acquired Rare, the game would evolve into the prequel in Perfect Dark Zero, which was uh, an interesting experience, but it definitely wasn't the Velvet Dark sequel that originally was planned. Now, Perfect Dark is set to have a comeback someday in the future, we'll see when that ever happens, but yeah, I can't help but to wonder what these other Perfect Dark games could have looked like, they were really starting to build out the universe during this time, there were books released, even the Game Boy game had its own storyline, it was kind of like the early days of Halo where they had all the books expanding the universe, Perfect Dark was just right up there with it for a first person shooter game building out the universe, and then everything stopped after Perfect Dark Zero. Similarly, Half-Life 2 had these two episodes that were fantastic and built up this universe and the story. People were getting really invested in Half-Life and its universe after Half-Life 2 episode 1 and 2. Then like all of a sudden, Portal would come out and that would like expand the universe at large some more. But at the end of episode 2 of Half-Life, we were left on a pretty massive cliffhanger that never got resolved. And it was obvious Half-Life 2 episode 3 or eventually Half-Life 3 was planned because why would they end the 
story like that. But man, Gabe, it's been years. What is going on? When are we ever going to see this? You know how insane it was after all of these years? Valve finally revives the Half-Life franchise and does it in the form of a VR prequel? How does the cliffhanger resolve, Gabe? I'm definitely getting too worked up over this as someone who has the flu trying to record this video. You know, there's a couple of other ones that we could really talk about and take a closer look at if we wanted to. Just some obvious things that had potential, but obviously fell to the wayside when other more important things would pop up. Fortnite's a huge example of this. It had this survival save the world game that was originally being developed before Epic Games realized that the battle royale genre could be blowing up with PUBG. And boom, resources were allocated to turn Fortnite into a battle royale game, and that became a huge hit. Unfortunately for Save the World, it would cause its development to slowly grind out over time before finally pretty much halting. I mean, I guess every once in a while there's a small update changing up a couple of things, but Fortnite Save the World definitely was kind of abandoned in favor of doing bombastic things with the Battle Royale, and I can't help but to wonder what Fortnite Save the World would have looked like had it had the budget and the team that the main Battle Royale game had. Probably something that wouldn't be as lucrative for Epic Games, so it would never happen, but there was something charming about the Save the World concept, even if the gameplay never really got to the point where it was super addicting and replayable. I would have liked to see what the original vision fully fleshed out could have looked like, but I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon. Okay, now I feel like everybody hates Fortnite discussion, but we can't help but to mention the fact that it's made some pretty unique and daring moves in the industry. The Simpsons Hit and Run, developed by Radical Entertainment, is a cult classic, and it was one of the best games attached to a non-video game franchise that I've ever played. Now it seemed like a no-brainer for the studio to make a sequel, and they did start working on a sequel sometime after the first one was released. This project did get as far as early prototyping phases, according to people who worked on it. In 2005, two years after Hit and Run's release though, EA acquired the license to make Simpsons video games, and in the same year Radical Entertainment was purchased by Vivendi and in 2008 sold to Activision, where they have been a support studio for Activision titles over the years. Destiny 1 is probably the most notable game they've worked on as a support studio. And with that, Hidden Run 2 was cancelled, not because of development issues, it was just because Vivendi decided not to renew the license in 2005, and with that there was no chance of making another Simpsons video game. And nowadays with the state of the Simpsons fandom, I think there's basically zero chance that we'll ever see a Hidden Run 2, which is it's a shame because the first one was truly a good game. But we haven't even gotten the game on backwards compatibility yet, so that is kind of an indicator of how bad the licensing agreements and like all the legality of that must be if they can't even put it on backwards compatibility on Xbox. Now there is one game that I wanted to talk about or we've wanted to talk about for a while and we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but Time Splitters 4. This is like the tragic story of a game in game development hell because Time Slayers 4 was announced, it was in development by Free Radical, which was a game studio in the UK, and then they got shut down. Then, years later, miraculously, the publisher Embracer Group was able to reunite the two main guys who made Time Splitters to open up a brand new studio, resurrecting Free Radical, and to begin building up a brand new Time Splitters game. And news just broke a couple days ago that it looks like that studio is now going to be facing potentially a new closure. Yeah, right before Christmas. Right before Christmas. Very sad news, very unlucky. Time Slayers 4 has had it rough. The first three Time Slayers games are incredible. If you haven't played them, check them out. They're first person shooters. They take place in like various time periods. It's really cool how they mix like the past and the future and all of this together into this story with a character that kind of looks like Vin Diesel. Nonetheless, <laughs> Time Splitters 4 was a game that like never came out and people had wanted a new one for a long time and there'd always been rumors and finally it looked like it was happening. And then bam, all of a sudden this news comes out and it's like, how do we get so close? And yet we're still so far. When did they announce it initially? Uh, I think it was like a PlayStation 3 announcement or something like that. Okay, so like mid to late 2000s oh yeah yeah probably like 2006 or 7 or something like that hmm, interesting it's uh it's really sad i remember we talked about it in our other video about like uh development hell and we talked about how it looked like this game was going to be one of the games to actually make it out of development hell because the ball was rolling they had a team and they had these cool sweaters made i mean look at these sweaters they're time splitter for Christmas sweaters or Time Splitters Christmas sweaters with the new Time Splitters logo. Yeah, that's sadly uh, not happening. Fortunately enough, at the very least, the only maybe small 
positive thing out of all of this is that another studio splash damage that's located nearby the studio has said that they will offer everybody who worked at free radical design at least a job interview at splash damage um because that's not fun to lose your job right around christmas that's true that's true i think all this impressive group stuff is happening because they had a deal with the saudi government or saudi company and that fell through so they didn't make as much money and now they have to lay off a bunch of people because i think they laid off a bunch of other studios too yeah i did hear they saw some big layoffs i didn't know about the the saudi government thing that's wild speaking of things that also had potential and are having support kind of just like messed with or wrapped up on uh, we weren't going to talk about this one in the whole video but i did want to bring it up to you during this section specifically but how do you feel about dmz they just announced call of duty's dmz is no longer going to be getting new updates the beta is now over you can still play it but there's nothing new coming you were so optimistic about dmz before the game came out and then dmz came out and you were so not optimistic about it anymore yeah i mean uh I, when, it, when they first announced it i was like really excited i mean i was really into tarkov i was like you know this could be cool with caught gunplay a little you know tarkov style game but it was so shallow and so like boring that I, I mean it was just a waste of time and i mean they realized it too i guess and that's why we'll probably never see dmz again that's probably the only inter iteration of this will ever get this my prediction i think for the most part the people who did like dmz probably haven't played like one of the dedicated games like that already or hadn't like really gotten hooked on like tarkov or um what else is there vigor on the xbox yeah there's there's tarkov and vigor that's all there that's, that's it only two extraction games you know i don't think that play numbers were huge and i mean sure there were some people who enjoyed it but i think you know i don't know I just don't know how you can play that mode for more than like an hour. I do think the zombie iteration is a little more fun. It's a little closer, but I still feel like it overall feels like an empty experience. It's just it's just like fetch quests, right? You just walk around, you just do this, you do that. And like, that's kind of not what COD is about. At least the zombie side, you level up your guns and, and there's a little more you can do. Like there's a reward for actually being involved in like killing the zombies and whatnot which is slightly yeah. better i guess but yeah the fetch quests being it and then that's it no i don't know it, it didn't click with me okay here's a question luke um because this is one that people are going to want to have in this video no matter what but uh does titanfall 3 exist did it ever exist uh i'm sure in like as a conceptual uh, or pre-production phase maybe it existed but i don't know if they actually ever started like major development on it how many times in the last year do you think like people have speculated that the game was about to shadow drop randomly or people were like the game is coming next week tuesday get ready guys and it never comes they're like oh in this apex legends trailer there's the number seven which leads to the main menu of titanfall 2 which makes us think uh, on the 7th of november titanfall 3 is coming out i don't know it's just copium i don't think uh it's real. I don't know. Maybe we'll get an announcement and then they start development. But I don't think it'll just shadow drop. Do you think it's real? I mean, I think at some point there was development on Titanfall 3. Like, maybe a couple of months after Titanfall 2. There was, like, plans or something. And then that obviously was thrown away. I do think Titanfall 3 would be awesome. I think we should get it. I don't know if it's going to be as revolutionary as everyone thinks it's going to be. But I still think it'd be a really good game. And maybe from there it can grow into like a really good experience. Another game that I think uh, never really made it out of early pre-production or conceptual phase is Dead Space 4. Uh, developers have said they did start thinking about Dead Space 4 and writing down ideas. And they even had maybe plans for Dead Space 4 before Dead Space 3 came out. Like ideas for story beats. And uh, I guess we never saw that materialize because EA kind of didn't like Dead Space 3 sales. And they were like, well... This franchise is gone. It's interesting. I haven't played Dead Space 3 other than I think you and I played like the first co-op mission. No context. I had no idea what was going on. We were like in the snow and then we we're in like a cyberpunk city or something like that. And like there's these people wanting to kidnap us, but then we went willingly and some people died or something. I don't remember too much about it. I thought it was a horror game series. So Dead Space 3, at least from what I played, felt like a pretty big departure from what I expected the series to be like. Yeah, it definitely, uh, it definitely wasn't as scary or anything like that and had a goofy story that um, the first two didn't have, you know. The first one was you were on a spaceship, it was like these tight quarters, and the second one you were kind of in this, I don't even know what to call it, it's like a, it was like a big building city thing, right? But it was still like scary and stuff, and uh, 
The third one was just really goofy. I don't know. All the characters were goofy. The cutscenes were really weird. And uh, I just don't know what they what they were smoking. Also, the co-op. Um, while I do like co-op games, I do think if your franchise had been non-co-op and is a horror game, a single-player horror game, it is kind of weird to introduce co-op because it kind of takes away from the experience. It can, it can mix things up. Like Resident Evil 6, I felt like they pushed co-op so hard on that game that it just changed the entire experience and some people like resident evil 6 but like it definitely was a big shift for the franchise like leaning into the co-op or was that five no it was five five two five and six had co-op but what i always think these campaigns they're closer to call of duty campaigns than they are to resident evil campaigns like resident evil 6 literally has that snowmobile level from uh modern warfare 2 like legit. Oh wait, really? Yeah, like legit. The same, basically the same level. Dude, remember I made the Resident Evil, like I played my first Resident Evil game and I made a video on it on Rocket's Law. Yeah, I remember. It had like 400 views on Resident Evil Zero. I think it's still on the channel. I was like, I finally tried Resident Evil Zero and it was okay. Like it was like, I didn't even beat the game. I got stuck and kind of just gave up after a while. Okay, so the mid 2000s, the game Prey came out. And I know we've talked about this a bit before in other videos and you have a strong opinion about it, but there was like the mid 2000s Prey that was really cool uh, and atmospheric. And then they were working on a sequel. The sequel got scrapped. Then a different game completely unrelated was developed and Bethesda slapped the Prey title kind of on it past the conceptual phase. And they had to kind of like pivot it into a Prey game. What was the, what's the deal with Prey? Like, what was that other game that got canceled? Well, I think Prey 2 would have been like uh, the cyberpunk space game, kind of, if that makes sense. The second one, I think, would have been like a time skip and then you're a bounty hunter on the planet and you might meet the protagonist from the first game. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. And it looked kind of cool. They actually had decent work done on it. There's like gameplay of it that looked actually kind of sick. I remember in the gameplay, you pull up to a bar and there's a target and then you chase him down through the city and it's just chasing and stuff on foot. It looked cool. And I mean, at the end of the day, I think there was like managerial issues between publisher and developer that kind of caused the game to fall apart. If I remember correctly, like that was the major reason. And I mean, I don't know, ever since Prey has just been laying dormant, I guess until they slept it on that one game. Right, which from what I can understand, I, I played a little bit of the new Prey game. And it seems like an okay game, but it's just a big departure from the original Prey game, which makes you wonder why are they even like using the same name, I guess? I mean, they, I guess they had no plans for it and they just like, we have this laying around, so we slap it on. But uh, I mean, I'm not a Prey lore expert. What do you mean? I thought you knew everything about Prey's lore. From what I can tell, it's not related. It's not related at all. Also, what I thought was cool, uh, Prey 1 was one of the only games I can remember that had a Native American protagonist that you played as. Okay, so also we didn't talk about this one in the Dead BRs video. I kind of forgot it existed. And looking back after our video went out and someone mentioned it in the comments, I realized that like, yeah, there was some hype around the game Radical Heights. It was like a battle royale game that was kind of almost aesthetically like a hybrid of Fortnite and PUBG, I think. But man, that game just like disappeared. It fell off so hard that we forgot about it when we we're doing a video on battle royals that fell off. I guess this was a, as good of time as any to bring it up and at least give it a mention here because it was a game that some people were excited about. It just uh, was also one of the earlier ones to die out. I've never, I've never heard of it. This reminds me of Fortnite, H1Z1 and PUBG. Are you sure this, this was a game people were excited for? Because I'm reading the comments and they're like, bad too often, good riddance, hashtag Heck watch. There were some people. I saw a couple of reviews. The game apparently, I just looked into this while we we're talking here. The game apparently had a five month development window and they wow. released it into what they called extreme early access. Uh, I don't know. If you guys played it, let us know in the comments because we obviously don't know what we're talking about. I'd play it. If we could play it right now, I would download it and play it. We would, middle of the podcast. I don't care. Yeah. You can edit it down. Good thing we can't. I guess. Yeah, good thing we can't. <laughs> uh, then, while we're on the topic of games that could have maybe gotten more content, right? Like, or whatever. Uh, Heroes of the Storm is another one that I personally really like. Is that a Dragon Force song? Actually, close. 
Close, close, close. I forgot what the Dragonforce song is called. I remember there was a debate in the video. Heroes of the Storm is like a MOBA, like League of Legends or Dota 2. Okay, yeah. But with uh, Blizzard characters, right? So like, you know, you had characters from Diablo, from StarCraft, from World of Warcraft. And it kind of had its charm. It's a lot simpler than League of Legends and Dota. I think, but they did just eventually just stop updating the game and adding content. You can still play it, the servers are still there. I don't know, it just doesn't get any new content and I did really enjoy it, I wish there was more. I wish they kept updating it. Speaking of games that could have gotten more updates, Marvel, the Avengers game that uh, like Crystal Dynamics did, this game was interesting. I remember when they first revealed it, everyone was like, this looks not that good. <laughs> and they ended up delaying the game and releasing it later on and like fixing up some stuff. So then when the game actually did release, it was kind of in an okay state. So then the game went from like, this game doesn't look good to it might not be perfect, but it looks promising because it was kind of going into this live service model and other superhero games had been good in the past, like uh, Spider-Man, you know? So it's like, if they can like refine the game enough where every character feels as good to play as like what Sony has with Spider-Man, maybe they're onto something here. And then they, you know, have this ambitious plan of like having this game supported as a live service game. And they did like some DLC and the DLC was actually like kind of good after a minute. But then yeah, the game uh, just like closed. It just ended, so um, yeah. I mean, you can still play it and uh, we could still go play and play it because we own it. We played a bit of it when, it, when at some point, I don't, I think I bought it and, and we played a little bit of it and it was okay. I played as Thor and I mean, it was cool how his hammer would come back to him and all that, but beyond like, a couple of cool gimmicks for each character. It didn't quite have that like edge where it felt snappy and really good the way that you would want a game like that to feel. And I think maybe it just bit off more than it could chew. It's kind of like the no, the caught zombies mode. Yeah, it, it was. It was a lot of just like hitting the same button over and over again to fight like robots or whatever we're fighting. Another game that uh, before launch got a lot of hate, uh, you know, maybe could have gotten more caught in the Star Wars Battlefront 2. And I mean, you remember how big that story was with Star Wars Battlefront 2. Oh, yeah. And then the game, surprisingly, like, when they turned things around and they, like, responded to the backlash as bad as it was at first, but, like, the plan to, like, fix up the game moving forward, when that was implemented, there was, like, a strong community of people who continued to play that game and supported it for a while. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes still hop on that game and play it, and I do really enjoy the stuff they did at post-content, or post-release, but I think there's still more stuff they could have done, so I'm kind of sad that we don't get more maps and more characters, because there's still some stuff missing uh, that I would have liked seeing from the Star Wars universe. I think there's a large enough player base who still play that game that they probably could have justified continuing to make more content for especially when like sometimes you'll see something like what ea did they did the what was that spaceship star wars game that you get queasy every time you play star wars squadron i think yeah was that what it was called that game lost its player base so quickly that i feel like if they would have put the time put into developing that into either a dlc for battlefront 2 it probably could have been a better win for both the players and ea or at least give squadrons more time for development because the game was just missing so much i felt like with that game we really should dig into squadrons at some point in one of these videos yeah also i mean i, I just think just a space shooter is not as popular. It's just a part of Star Wars Battlefront that was popular. I, I just don't think it works as its own. And also for Star Wars Battlefront 2, they did add quite a few of maps, but I feel like they probably couldn't do more because this was a game made by DICE and DICE had to move on to make Battlefield, right? And they probably didn't have enough resources to make both. Well, time. wasn't there originally plans for a Battlefront 3? Mm, not a new one. Just the old one that we talked about. Yeah, I mean, like not like a not like to the full extent of like, uh, like cutting room floor prototypes and stuff that were deep in development, but like I thought way back there was like before Battlefront Two even released. I think I remember that there was rumors that Battlefront Three was like supposed to come out to coincide with like the final like the Skywalker saga movie because they were putting out like a big multiplayer game with each film release. Right, and I think that. There should have been one that would have landed there, but I think with all of the backlash of Battlefront 2, I think they just chose not to continue developing anymore with the contract that they had with Disney. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't mind getting a uh, South Battlefront 3 from DICE. I don't know if it'll ever happen, though. Probably not. I wonder if, like, the Battlefront 2 drama was so sub significant, rightfully so at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah But for sure. so much, so damaging that, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll ever see uh, Battlefront brought back 
again. Which sucks, but oh well. Maybe 10, 10, 20 years from now. Who knows? They'll reboot it again. They'll do Star Wars, a new Star Wars Battlefront 1 and a new Star Wars Battlefront 2. And maybe if they don't get any, if they don't get into any drama, we'll get a Star Wars Battlefront 3 after that. One day, one day. Do you think Splitgate could have been better, bigger, more potential? That game came and went very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it blew up overnight, basically. And I mean, I'm not too sure why it fell off so hard. It is a very interesting case when it comes to Splitgate, because I feel like there was so much potential when the game came out with this idea of like Halo type gameplay mixed with portals. And then there were so many issues when it came to console with like the servers, there was these long queue times. I, I mean, I just don't think the, the people realized how massive the game would be once it came to console because there was such a demand for real Halo type gameplay. You know, although otherwise you were forced to play Halo 5 at the time. Infinite wasn't out yet. So this was like something that was free to play. People probably went in with really low expectations and saw that like the game was actually decent because it had been in development on PC for so long before. This is like a bigger issue I see with games like Halo, games like Splitgate, where I do wonder how like some of these arena styled games are going to retain players long term. And uh, I don't know if it's just like a natural fall off that happens pretty quickly, even if you have content. I mean, not having content like in Halo's case definitely did not help. I do wonder like how something like Splitgate, especially since we know that there's a new Splitgate game being in development. It might not be called Splitgate, but there's a new FPS game that they're working on that's going to have portals in it that's going to come out sometime in the future. I, I really do wonder about that one. I mean, the thing is, Splitgate, it was a small project. The gameplay felt snug, but like it was missing like that extra type of content too, like uh, another mode or something like that, right? Like it didn't have campaign. It didn't have like a battle royale maybe. And I mean, obviously they couldn't do that with what they had at the time. But I do wonder if the the next split gate, split gate or whatever they call it uh, has to like step it up in order to compete. Right. I'm worried that they're going to offer the similar amount of features, like a basic map creator, multiplayer playlists, and then just enhanced visuals and expect that like that's going to be enough of an experience to like have people locked in and like ready to dedicate their time to it because it is going to need something a little more than just portals i think to give it that edge i think like they had something with like the time trial portal mode and i really think they should have just done a campaign um i don't think they're going to but i really do think that a campaign would have been cool i do think though um do you think a no portal mode could have worked too and i know it's like that's what made Splitgate special, but like Fortnite has a no build mode and it's decently popular too. And I just think the skill gap with the portals might have been a little too high for some people. And uh, I think that's also kind of frustrating. That's maybe why they lost some players. You know what I mean? Because if you get kept getting killed by some sweaty nerd that like portals in the spots, you don't know, like has the lineups and stuff. You know, eventually you're just like, oh, whatever. Maybe if the sequel refines some of that. They can yeah. keep the portals in, but I mean, maybe they don't even have portal guns. Maybe they'll just have portals around, like in predetermined places or something that change the sight lines up or something. There's a lot they could do with it. The thing that I find very interesting, though, is like part of Splitgate's success was that it was doing what Halo had failed to do for such a long time. Even if people fell off, like it was always interesting to see a lot of people comparing Splitgate to Halo Infinite, ourselves included. I mean, we did the sponsored tie-in for like their season pass where they sponsored a bunch of like Halo YouTubers to just talk about the new season, whatever we wanted to talk about. So obviously the go-to a lot of Halo content creators because we we're doing just Halo content back then was to like compare it to Halo because I mean, that's what the audience was. I mean, it, it did feel like Halo and I mean, Halo's the last big arena shooter that's still around right and i mean we were playing splitgate at the time it's not like we weren't playing it we were actually playing it now and mind you like i mean we're not being we're not sponsored by splitgate for this video or anything we're and we were always allowed to say whatever we wanted but uh it was just some people in the halo community not even people it's a stupid story people were mad that so many halo content creators were covering splitgate on the same day which was the day of the um the season pass launching uh, the, or their new season of the game. But the thing was, Splitgate genuinely felt like a very fun game. Like the like custom modes that were out there were a lot of fun. They had a gun game mode that we were playing a lot of. It had a forge mode. <laughs> it wasn't like forge what you'd expect in Halo, but Halo didn't even have forge at that point. But yeah, I, I genuinely 
sorry, camera quality changed, my SD card got full. But long story short, I genuinely thought that Splitgate was a really interesting experience. At the time, like, Splitgate was solid for a small group of people that put that game together, like, making a competitive experience that was, like, kind of being compared to against a triple A game like Halo Infinite. And ranked mode was actually kind of fun. We played that one mode where you had to, like, get momentum on taking out the other players and, like, trying oh, to take right. out the players while the spawn timer went up. Yeah, 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 That was a lot of fun. And um, maybe if they had better maps and not just, like, block outs, I think that that could have really maybe been a thing. I don't know. I will be excited to see whatever they end up choosing to put out in the future. Yeah, I mean, they made one game. They showed that they're talented. So I do think they can do something with the extra resources they have now and hopefully, like, actually, you know, make something that looks... Or they'll change, like, the landscape for arena shooters, maybe even. Who knows? Absolutely. But anyways, th these were the games that we thought had a lot of potential that uh, didn't get to see their full potential before, like, support was dropped or the game was just cancelled. Uh, what game did we miss out on? There were a lot for this video. We had a massive list, and we had to cut, 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 and then even then, we had a lot just going into this last section, this podcast-style section that we added, that we're like, how are we going to fit all this in and not make this video ridiculously drawn out or something so let us know in the comments maybe we'll revisit it in another video um a similar topic where we'll talk about games we want to miss kind of like how we brought up radical heights here even though we missed it in the br video so uh yeah l let us know uh thanks so much for all the support all of you guys watching our patrons you guys are incredible luke say something to our patrons thank you for being there for us and uh supporting us there and you if go. you want to check out our patreon link is down in the description um yeah otherwise uh thanks so much for watching make sure you guys are subscribed use code rocket slot to get your gamer subs seriously uh make a, they make a great gift for someone you know hook them up uh but yeah that's it for today we'll see you guys all next time with a new video bye bye